Hi, everyone. Are we all sleepy from lunch? Okay, let's wake up. Uh, so, like Daria said, my name is Brooke Wainwright, and today I'm going to be talking about two Listenia species that are both listed and found in vernal pools, and we're going to look at their performance in created vernal pool habitat. Um, this project is by no means my own. It was done in conjunction with Nancy Emery, the principal investigator out of uh, CU Boulder, and Rafika La Rosa, who's over there on the left. And if you ask me any questions that are too hard, I'm going to defer to Rafika. <laughs> so, uh, and I'd also like to thank the Northern California botanists for having me. I'm really happy to be here. So before we get into our questions, etc., um, let's all get on the same page about what vernal pools are. They are temporary wetlands that fill with water during the winter and then slowly evaporate or drain out during the spring and summer. And what this does is create these highly unique um, environmental conditions that create islands of habitat and have high levels of endemism, both for plants and animals. So there are about 200 plants in California that are either entirely dependent upon or closely associated with vernal pools. Many of those are native. About half are uh, endemic to vernal pools specifically. And about three-fourths are annuals, which is due to the annual nature of these vernal pools. And then it's hard to know exactly how much vernal pool habitat has been lost but many estimates are around the 85 to 95% range. So that is a dramatic loss of vernal pool habitat in California um, that we once had before California was settled. So in light of that huge loss, there has been a lot of mitigation done for these vernal pools and this land um, continues to be developed um, and converted to uh, agriculture or urban development or other uses. So mitigation is highly pre prevalent in California. Um, and so that is done by, one way that's done is by recreating these pools. So we make artificial pools, we find grasslands with similar, not me, I'm saying we, it's not, I don't do it. Um, we find similar grasslands um, with similar soils and then we uh, man-make these pools, trying to mimic the hydrology and topography of those natural pools. Then these pools are inoculated with seeds from natural pools, and these um, inoculations have varying success, and it's also the subject of some controversy because um, it just gets complicated, like where are these seeds coming from? Should we be moving them maybe 100 or 200 miles to these created pools? Are these seeds doing better in the created pools, or are we harming them and actually thinking that we're saving them? So two of the species, two of those 200 species that I'm going to talk about today are both in the genus uh, Lysenia, and uh, kudos if you can tell me exactly which species those are from these two pictures, uh, but I'll tell you. The first one is Lysenia burkei, Virx goldfield. This is a vernal pool species. It's state and federally endangered, and it's restricted to the north coast range um, of California, mostly in the Sonoma and Napa area. The other species is Lysenia contrigans, uh, the Contra Costa gold fields, also restricted to vernal pools um, with a much broader range, but um, similar occurrences as Berkeyi. And contrigans is also federally endangered. And I'll also mention that these two species are the subject of um, intense mitigation efforts in their respective ranges. And they are close relatives of each other. They are the two most closely related um, species to each other in the Lysenia genus, in addition to Lysenia plumontii, which you may be familiar with. So in light of these two species, their status, and the intense mitigation efforts that are going on to create um, vernal pools, we want to know, does the source population for these species, does that affect um, seed success in created pools? So one hypothesis is that yes, source population affects the success. That might indicate that there's high levels of local adaptation of those source populations. Maybe they're restricted gene pools. Maybe there's inbreeding depression that would affect their success differentially in these created pools. 
Alternatively, maybe all of these source populations perform similarly because pollen and um, fertilization happens kind of uniformly throughout all the populations, so they are all equally equipped to succeed in these um, created pools. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're also asking uh, if the success varies between natural and created pools. Are we actually doing these flowers any favors by bringing them to created pools? Do they perform similarly or do they perform worse or better? So if these created pools accurately mimic the native pools, we might see similar responses in terms of uh, success. If they, maybe they offer some uh, competitive release that lets these flowers actually do far better in the created pools, or maybe we got the environmental conditions a little bit, a little bit off so that these flowers don't actually do as well in the created pools. That's another thing we're gonna find out shortly. Okay, so some more background, Lysenia Burkia, this is just uh, a map showing the populations that we sampled for the study. The orange stars are the source populations where we collected seeds. The yellow stars are created pools where we inoculated seeds. And then the orange dots are for a molecular, molecular analysis that's happening concurrently, led by Nancy Amory, where we're looking at the genetic structure across the geographic range of this species. So ignore those for now. We can talk about them later if you'd like. And then Lysenia conjugin, same thing. The blue stars are uh, sites where we collected seeds for the study. The red star is the one created pool that we have, and then the dots are for genetic sampling. And you can see also that conjugins was all the way down to uh, Fort Ord National Monument in Monterey, so much, much broader range. So how do we do this? In spring of 2018, uh, Rafika actually collected all the seeds from these source populations. We brought them back to the lab and gave them a brief summer warming treatment, not too much, we didn't like toast them. And then we glued them meticulously to toothpicks and those toothpicks were colored according to the source population <coughs> location. Then we brought them back to California and planted them in these pools. And this um, schemata of a pool, we're looking at it at eye level, so you're not looking down at it. <coughs> That confused me, so just I want you to be with me. Um, and so each site has one to three pools. Each pool has two transects. And each transect has five plots of, um, of two picks. So that means there's ten plots per pool. In the created pools, we had grids of 52 picks, ten from each source population that were laid out in a random fashion. So e here, each color corresponds to a different source population. In the natural pools, we had grids of 10 seeds, and the only, the home genotypes of the, those seeds went back into their home sites. So we didn't do any like crisscrossing with source populations. And so this design allows us to answer those two questions. Does source population affect the performance in created pools, the colorful grid will tell us that answer. And then how does natural pool success compare with created pool success? And comparing these two grids will help us do that. So this is just what it looked like in practice. This is a created pool. You can see there's very little vegetation. Um, and there's one transect, uh, the colorful 50 toothpick grid at the top, and then some of our first germinants here on the bottom right. Yeah. That, it's so much fun to find germinates. I could talk all day about that. Um, okay, so and then in the natural sites, this is what it looked like. Much more vegetation and only those 10 toothpicks laid out in that grid. All of the same color. And the other thing I'll add for the, uh, the methods is that we added pollinator exclusion cages. And this was to prevent um, pollen flow from those seeds that we brought in from these wider geographic areas. So there was no fertilization happening uh, with these seeds that we planted. And so for that reason, we're not measuring seed set for these plants. Instead, we're measuring um, like flower output and reproductive biomass. Okay, so what did we find? And actually, I'm gonna back up and not let you look at the results. 
So this is our first pass at the results. We only finished weighing a lot of these plants like last week. Um, so take these results with a grain of salt. There's more to come. Um, but yeah, very, just broad strokes right now. So bear with us. Okay. That being said, I hope you find it interesting. So with Lysenia burkii, um, we found that four out of the five populations performed similarly in terms of survival. So this, we used a logistic model with a binomial distribution. Um, so either it was a zero if it didn't survive all the way to flowering or never germinated, or a one if it survived to flowering. And so four were all similar. There was one site that performed much worse than all the others, and that was um, significantly different than all the other four. And I'll also mention that the highest bar here maxes out at about 0.07. So we're looking at about 7% um, survival to flowering for Berkeley. For conjugans, we found that all five populations performed similarly in terms of survival. Then we wanted to look at reproductive biomass. So for this, now of the ones that survived, we're ignoring all the zeros, the many, many zeros that we had, and we're only looking at those that survived and measuring how much did they invest in reproduction. And we found that for both species, uh, they all, there was no significant differences among um, uh, their reproductive investment or reproductive biomass. So for our second question, comparing natural and created pools, uh, we found that it varied by site and species. So for Lysenia burkii, one site isn't included because it wasn't planted back in its home site, so there's only four sites now. And we found varying results. So sometimes in the second column, we have which type of pool had higher survival. Sometimes it was natural, sometimes it was created, and sometimes there was no difference between the two. And same with um, the reproductive biomass, we see that Created pools tended to have higher reproductive biomass, but sometimes there is no difference. And then with conjugates, um, many, the, size, the sites with an asterisk, they did not have enough data to do this analysis, so created kind of wins by default, um, but just know that those didn't actually go under analysis. There was just not enough data in the natural sites. But we see this flipped result at that one Lysenia conjugate site for natural and created, where natural was higher survival, but created pools had higher biomass. So uh, just to reiterate our results, that we most of these sites perform similarly in creative pools in terms of survival and reproductive biomass, um, with the exception of one Lysenia burkii site. And the performance varied between natural and created pools for each, um, for each source population. So there's definitely more to uncover for that. Um, so just be aware that there's more analysis to be done. I suspect that there's a lot more going on with the plot location within the pool, as well as certain pools um, having more survival than others. And that we haven't really started to look at, but maybe I'll do that tonight. We can ask it tomorrow. Um, and then in addition to that, we've planted a second year of toothpicks just last month. And we will look at these in the spring, so we'll have two years um, of data eventually for this project. And then finally, the molecular analysis is still ongoing, and that will um, also kind of get at the genetic variation and gene flow for these populations of these two species. With that, I'd like to thank all of these oops, these uh, landowners um, and different agency folks that helped us with this project, as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Section 6 grant, um, and all the people that helped in the field in the rain and cold weather. So with that, I will take questions. <laughs>